There is a very rich history of Islam, a very rich history, and uh, it really is kind of outside the scope of apologetics, though, for the most part, um, so I'm not going to cover it in depth. What matters far more is the history of Muhammad, um, and we are going to talk about that here. But I'm going to give you a brief overview of Islam. Uh, Muhammad was born at the end of the 6th century, 570 AD. He started his ministry again. Well. The Quran uh, came first in 610 AD. He dies in 632 when the early caliphate starts. Muslims consider, Sunni Muslims consider the early caliphate to be rightly guided. Uh, in other words, these people were appointed by God and these people uh, were, their decisions were divinely ordained. Uh, though they were not prophets like Muhammad, uh, they were rightly guided by Allah. Um, again, that's a Sunni belief. The later caliphate, not so much, uh, lasted till 1258. The Spanish Inquisition is often understood as the downfall of uh, the Islamic society, the beginning of the tables turning. Um, and then the Ottoman Empire we know lasted until 1924. Here's a graphic of the expansion of the Islamic Empire. You take a look at the red there, that's what Muhammad managed to do during his time. He had conquered pretty much all of Arabia. Uh, unbelievable what he was able to do, especially since he did most of that in about 13 years. Then we see, take a look at the pink section or the salmon section, if you will. That was the expansion during the uh, rightly guided caliphs, the first few caliphs. And then after that, the Umayyad Caliphate. Uh, so by the middle of the eighth century, you have got Islam expanding from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indus. That's fast. And Muslims often see this as a sign of God's uh, divine seal of approval on the Islamic empire. They're very proud of that, um, the rate of expansion. A lot of Muslims will say that this was, especially in the West, will say that this was not the result of the wars. Uh, the wars, though it did expand the empire, it didn't convert people, is what a lot of people will say. The conversions happened when people saw how beautiful Islam was. Um, but the, the expansion of the empire, uh, did happen through war. That's what they'll often say. Not the conversions, but the expansion of the empire. Muhammad's life, though, is extremely important, especially for apologetic purposes. We can't really pin down any of the fault, any of the blame of modern Muslims on Islam itself, unless we can draw a link from Muhammad and the Quran to what modern Muslims are doing, a legitimate link. So when you have people who will point to all the battles and uh, in the bloodshed that happened between Muslims and around the world, uh, the terrorist attacks, and they'll say, look, this is what Islam is. Most Muslims today will say, no, that is not what Islam is. These Muslims have hijacked Islam. They're making Islam look bad. That's the common Western response to the terrorism that is occurring around the world today. When we talk about Muhammad's life, Muhammad's teachings, we are talking about the universally accepted origin of Islam. And so to be able to draw a link between what Muhammad taught and what is going on today is, it's the sine qua non really of apologetics here. You have to have that, um, at least the Quran, if not Muhammad's life. So here's Muhammad's life in a nutshell. You've got him starting the, the Meccan period of his ministry in 610 AD. Again, at that time, he spoke simply to his wife uh, and to his friend and to his cousin and a few other people, not many. He wasn't publicly proclaiming God. It wasn't until 613 that he started publicly proclaiming Allah. And in the early Meccan ministry phase, you had about 40 people who had accepted Islam. So between 610 to 617, the numbers were about 40. Then there was a boycott in 617. Uh, what the Arabs at the time were doing was they started to get together and to say, we are not going to trade with this family. Now the family was the family that was led by Muhammad's uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib was extremely important to Muhammad for a, a majority of, uh, a large number of reasons, but primarily because Abu Talib had a large hand to play in raising Muhammad. When Muhammad was born, um, 570 AD, when Muhammad was born, his father had already died. So he was born to a widow. His mother then died when he was six years old. And so he was an orphan at a young age. This might have uh, a lot to do with how much compassion he showed orphans. 
He then went to his grandfather's house, and his grandfather died when he was eight. So two years later, his grandfather died. So Muhammad's going from place to place to place. He settles with his uncle. And his uncle is the one who's kind of his protector, kind of functioning as his father um, in a way. And so by the time you have Muhammad preaching, he is preaching monotheism in a pagan area. Understand, again, a large part of the commerce occurs in Mecca because people are coming to worship all the gods. And if Muhammad is saying there is only one God, he is going to alienate all these people that are coming from all over to worship there. These are the people who bring their trade. This is where the commerce happens. So if Muhammad attacks polytheism, he's essentially jeopardizing the commerce of the area. And so the pagans in Mecca responded slowly, but surely they responded with different degrees of persecution. Bless you, according to the Muslims. In the year 617, they decided to boycott the family, the family that was led up by Muhammad's uncle, because Muhammad's uncle was the one who was protecting Muhammad. If anyone tried to harm Muhammad, it would be up to the uncle or someone else in the family to defend Muhammad. That's what families were for, that's how they worked. And so acting as Muhammad's protector, they allowed Muhammad to successfully preach in Mecca until 617 AD. At that point, the rest of the Meccans decided to boycott the family. And so the, the family began to have to find alternate means for trade, for food, for sustenance. In 619 AD, uh, Muhammad's uncle dies. Muhammad's first wife also dies the same year. It's unclear whether this was a result or not of the boycott, um, but regardless, this was the most painful year for Muhammad, 619 AD. Uh, his first wife, when he was married to her, Khadija, he was 25 years old when he got married to her. By this point, he is 49. So he's married to her for 24 years, and he often reminisced about his first wife, and he would tell his other wives later that she was the most per uh, important one to him. During that time, he was monogamous. He was only married to Khadija. It wasn't until after Khadija that we see Muhammad uh, practicing polygamy. In 619 AD, when Muhammad's uncle dies, all of a sudden he has lost protection, and now, if someone hurts him or tries to kill him, there will be no retribution. Muhammad starts looking for an alternate um, means of safety. Ultimately, he finds that in Medina. And so he flees to Medina in 622. 622 AD is the most important date for the Islamic calendar. This is when Muhammad uh, undergoes the Hijra or the flight. By going to Medina, which was at the time called Yathrib, when Muhammad went to Medina, it wasn't called Medina, it was called Yathrib. Him going there is what changed it, or his going there, he going there, changed it to Medina. Medina was a city divided. It had three Jewish tribes and two pagan tribes. So you had conflict between Jews and pagans. The Jews looked to Muhammad as a fellow monotheist, and the pagans looked to Muhammad as a, fo a fellow Arab. And so Muhammad quickly, and immediately actually, took control of Medina. He was given leadership. He was made the arbiter and judge of Medina. And so when people had issues and conflicts, they would go to Muhammad, Muhammad would decide them. Within a matter of months, the caravans that were leaving from Mecca um, became, came under siege uh, by the Muslims. So according to early Muslim sources, most Muslims today, by the way, would not say this, but this is according to early Muslim sources, the caravans leaving Mecca, the city where Muhammad had been, were under siege by Muslims in Medina. And often Muslims who know that will say that was because they were trying to get their stuff back. They had to flee to Medina and the Meccans were now selling their stuff, so the Muslims were trying to get their stuff back. This led to the first major battle, the Battle of Badr. During this battle, according to the records, 313 Muslims were fighting a thousand Meccans. The Muslims had uh, one horse, just a few camels, they were poorly armored, no real warriors, or not many warriors, most of them were militia. Um, whereas the Meccans brought a thousand people, they were well armored, well trained, they had fought, uh, and the Muslims won the battle. This battle marks the beginning of Islamic battles. Before this, you had minor raids, nothing big, but at this point, you have Islamic battles, um, and they begin to occur, and you see uh, warfare entering into Islamic theology in a much more profound sense. 
Muslims are often very, very proud of the Battle of Badr. They see this as a defining moment where God shows through military power that Muhammad is ordained by him, um, by Allah himself to win. However, the Battle of Uhud, which happened the next year, did not go quite as well. Um, Muslims will often say that it was a tie. Uh, you look at the record, though, it, it doesn't look so good for the Muslims. There were a lot of casualties. Muhammad himself was injured during the Battle of Uhud, and uh, it was a bad moment. The Battle of the Trench did come to a stalemate. This was a few years later. Meccans uh, came to put Medina under siege. Muslims had learned a uh, trick of warfare and had decided to build a trench around their city. So the Meccans were unable to get over the trench. However, at this time, the third of the three tribes of Jews in the, in the city of Mecca, I'm sorry, in the city of Medina, uh, had tried to help the Meccans. They had tried to help Meccans take over Medina. Um, this is probably because the first two tribes had been uh, expelled from the city, um, and they were the last tribe left, and they were afraid of what was gonna happen to them. But because the Battle of the Trench ended in a stalemate, Muhammad had the capacity to do whatever he wanted um, with, the, uh, with the, the Medinan Jews there. And according to history, Muhammad then beheaded all the adult men uh, from the tribe of Jews, and he sold the women, the children, including the young boys, into slavery and took their possessions as booty. This marked a severe turn in attitude between Muhammad and Jews. Uh, pretty much from this point on, Jews were not seen in a good light. Christians kind of were still, uh, but not as much. After a few years, Muhammad was able to win allies, tribes throughout Mecca, uh, I'm sorry, throughout uh, Arabia, to his side, and he was able to march on Mecca with 10,000 soldiers. And so he was able to overcome Mecca with a host of soldiers at his side. At this time, the records indicate that Muhammad showed a high degree of mercy he forgave virtually everyone. Um, people who, were, who did not want to be killed, who did not want to fight, they could go into their homes, so they could remain in their homes, or they could go to the houses of certain people that Muhammad named, or they could go to the Kaaba. And if they went to any of those places, they would be safe. If they were in the street, or if they tried to fight, they would be killed. Um, so with minimal bloodshed, Muslims took over Mecca. At this time, there were approximately nine people who, even though they sought clemency, Muhammad still uh, still killed them, but that was just nine. The vast majority of people had mercy at the hands of Muhammad. Muslims often point to this event today to say that Muhammad was the most merciful man who ever walked the earth. Here's a group of people who led to the death of his wife, the death of his uncle, um, who had tried to attack him and persecuted him, and look, Muhammad showed them mercy. Isn't he the most merciful man? Uh, and there is a degree of mercy that we have to take into account um, here at this event if the records are accurate. For a few years, Muhammad was back in Mecca uh, for a short period of time. Um, the records indicate he went back and forth from Medina to Mecca, um, but he died ultimately in 632 AD. Any questions on history, Muhammad's life? Yes. So can you go over the point about how he walked into a situation where the pagans and the Jews were kind of wrestling with each other, how he got in control of that? By uh, he was invited to the city, and I think he was seen as a potential arbiter, so they, they both wanted him uh, as the one who would help out. Yep. Can you talk about the history between when the first battle was and when he uh, started uh, acting as governor of Medina during the time when he was conducting raids? What did that time do? So he, at this point, he's, he's settling um, some of the issues between the polytheists and the Jews there. He's establishing his position. He's becoming, to beco he's becoming to be a statesman. At first, he was not a statesman at all in Mecca. He was simply a preacher. Um, here, he begins to start setting out rules, regulations. Um, you see things changing um, as far as the direction people prayed, what, uh, what direction they prayed. Um, the laws became more well flayed out at this time. Uh, the, between the first battle and the raids, he was still in a good relation with the Jews. Um, the, the change in the situation there didn't happen until the next few years. 
Keep in mind, though, that it's not long. That's about a two-year period. Um, and it was within the first year, about 11 months in, that the first raid, the Nakhla raid, occurred. So it was about, the, that period is about a year. We're going to talk tomorrow as well about the sources on Muhammad's life. Again, right now what I'm giving you is the way Muslims will talk about Muhammad's life. Tomorrow we're going to go into the historical Muhammad and you're going to have a different perception of virtually all of this. It's like going from physical chem to organic chem. It's like, what just happened? <laughs> yeah. Your previous slide showed, you mentioned how he conquered um, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. The time he died. So I was thinking that that started with his conquest of Mecca, but. No, there was a lot of the tribes when they allied with him, it was kind of seen as a conquering. Um, so a lot of these areas weren't even fought for. Um, people just allied with him. Um, and ultimately, when Muhammad dies, many of these tribes try to break away. Um, Abu Bakr, his successor, has to uh, initiate what are called the apostate wars. Ten major battles where uh, people were made to stick with Islam. Um, so you could learn about that if you'd like. Uh, but a lot of these were just allegiances that ultimately were consolidated under Abu Bakr's reign. Um, I noticed I didn't tell you what Fatrat he was. Uh, that was the three year period where Muhammad didn't preach publicly um, and he didn't actually receive much revelation at all, if any. Um, it seems that after Muhammad received his first revelation, uh, he was unsure of his ministry. He didn't know what was going on and it wasn't for a few years that he kind of gained his bearings. That is what uh, a lot of the Muslims will say, that by taking additional wives, he would create an allegiance with an additional tribe. Um, it's uncertain how many wives Muhammad had. Um, numbers range from nine to 23. Uh, it depends on how you see uh, concubines. Um, many Muslims say there's no such thing as concubines in Islam, and so they were all his wives. Um, many will say no, those were a lot of concubines, and so he had nine wives. Um, but yeah, a lot of those relations were undertaken for political purposes, and that was common practice. Okay, so let's talk about the Hadith. Now, you might be asking Nabil, where are you getting a lot of this stuff about Muhammad, his life? What are the sources here? Um, we're gonna talk much more in depth about the sources tomorrow, but for now, what really matters is what Muslims see as the potential sources on Muhammad's life, and those are called the Hadith. The Hadith are collections of sayings of Muhammad, and often subsumed into that concept are the Sunnah, which are the actions of Muhammad, or the practices. Muslims aspire to replicate Muhammad in his actions and sayings as much as possible. They, they turn to these in order to replicate Muhammad to the best of their ability. If you see Muslims with beards, and a lot of them have beards, um, and shaved mustaches, so you'll see they've got this big beard and a shaved mustache, that is because that's what Muhammad was supposed to have had, a large beard with a shaved mustache. You'll see Muslim men often making sure that their pants don't go below their ankles. That is because Muhammad supposedly did not let his pants go below his ankles. Um, again, I told you about how my mom told me to walk in the bathroom with my left foot first. That's because that's how Muhammad used to do it. How do you learn all this? Not through the Quran, through Hadith and through Sunnah. That is how you emulate his life, and you earn blessings by doing so. Again, the Quran told us Muhammad is a perfect exemplar, follow him. And Muhammad's t uh, Muslims take that to the nth degree, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them take that to the nth degree. And so they're trying to practice Islam by emulating Muhammad. He is their exemplar, and this happens through the Hadith. Now the Quran doesn't give a lot of details that are necessary for Islamic life. The Quran was supplemented by oral tradition until those traditions were written down, and they were written down as hadith. So, for example, the five daily prayers, how exactly do you pray them? What words exactly do you pray? When do you bow, when do you stand, uh, etc.? What about the words you pray during the ceremonial washing? All of that comes from hadith. It does not come from the Quran. How many prayers are there? The Quran only names three, but there are five daily prayers. 
comes from the Hadith. So the Hadith by Muslims are seen as a necessary component to Islam. There is a small faction of Muslims called Qur'ani, um, Qur'ani Muslims, um, and these are Muslims who follow only the Qur'an, none, none of the Hadith, and they look very different from most other Muslims. There's a debate going on right now in uh, University of Toronto. Um, well, it was probably over a few hours ago. Um, but uh, it's between a man by the name of Tony Costa, an amazing uh, apologist um, and warrior for the Lord, and he's debating a Qur'ani Muslim. Um, so they have a position too, and it's very, very different. Islam looks very different if you only go off the Qur'an. Now, the Hadith are not a book you can go to. Oh look, here are all the Hadith. No, there's a bunch of different Hadith, and Muslims grade them accordingly. Uh, they, they call their, did I write this here? I'm not sure if I did. Um, so various sects of Islam follow different hadith. The Shia, for example, do not follow the Sunni hadith at all. Uh, they have their own books of hadith. The Sunni hadith uh, are of different levels. There's the Sahih, which are considered the most accurate hadith. Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. And therefore, if you're going to converse with the Muslim and talk about Muhammad's life, it would be best to be con well conversant with Sahih Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim. But there are others. For example, Sunan Abu Daud is often considered the third most trustworthy book. Uh, it's given the title Sunan as opposed to Sahih because the author was attempting to collect the actions of Muhammad and not the sayings. And he did so based on a different criteria than authenticity, which is what the Sahih were for. The Musnad, uh, for example, uh, Musnad Ahmad, um, those are sayings based on different companions of Muhammad. So according to this companion, Muhammad said X, Y, and Z. According to this companion, Muhammad said X, Y, and Z. They're listed accordingly in the Musnad. The thing about Hadith, though, uh, again, we have to remember that the society here was, for the most part, preliterate. In order for the Hadith to be propagated and to be considered trustworthy, you had to have the Hadith, so that's the, the saying proper, like, so for example, uh, Muhammad said these words. You know, that's the saying proper. That's called the Matan. And then there's the list of people who transferred this Hadith. So Muhammad said it to such and such, who 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 said it to me, this. That's called the Isnad, the chain of transmission. That is essential for uh, the ulum, for the sciences of hadith. Do I talk? Oh yeah, I do talk about that here. So Muslims say that there's a whole science of understanding hadith. That you have to grade the hadith according to who said it, how many people said it. Was that person trustworthy? Are there multiple lines of people who remember this saying? Um, and these hadith were recorded, most of them, about the third century after Muhammad. So 200 to 250 years transpired between Muhammad and the Hadith. As you can imagine, there were hundreds of thousands of fabricated Hadith. And Muslims uh, agree to that. They will say that there were hundreds of thousands of Hadith that were fabricated, and that is why it's extremely important to grade them and to know which ones are accurate and which ones are not. That is the science of Hadith. And uh, if you go to some very detailed commentaries on hadith, you will see that you'll see the grading. Is it mutawatir, which means as strong as it can be? Is it daif, which means weak, um, or probably not true? Or is it ahad, which means there's only one good line of transmission? Uh, there's all kinds of gradings for the hadith, um, and there's a whole field of hadith grading called the ulum of hadith. The Hadith stand apart from biographies. Biographies are different. Those are called the Sita. They're not nearly as important to Muslims. Muslims don't turn to the Sita to learn about Muhammad. They turn to the Hadith for the most part. They do look at the Sita, but they can't trust them, so they don't know how much to believe them. Uh, that is the average Muslim. Now, scholars turn to Sita all the time, Muslim scholars. They will turn to Sita all the time because it's their source of Muhammad's life. But the average Muslim, they try to stick with the Hadith and mainly Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Any questions on the Hadith? I can't under, understate how important the Hadith are for Islamic life. They're extremely important. This is how you get back to Muhammad, apart from the Quran. The Quran only mentions Muhammad by name four times, by the way. Uh, the Quran only mentions Muhammad by name four times. Uh, it references him a lot in the second person, you, 
Um, but by name, four times. If you want to learn about Muhammad, you go to other sources. Yep. Um, you mentioned earlier when you were talking about your own um, conversion, how you know, want to and not, and you think they would just like, reject the deed that were harder to explain. Like, how does that work when it, it seems like, especially from our readings and this lecture, that it's so important and central to the faith? How does that line up that you just dismiss it? They often accept the hadith that defend their positions and they'll deny the hadith that don't. Now, we see that as cherry picking, and it is. But what they will see that as is, I received my teaching on Islam from my imam. My imam did not teach me that. Therefore, I don't think that's accurate. They might not verbalize it in that manner, but the authoritative structure is extremely important for Muslims. Um, as you can see from the isnad, it really matters who you learn from. Um, and so, if you come up and you show them this hadith they've never seen, They'll, they'll probably turn around and say it's fabricated if it's something that damages their position because that's the defense that they have. Now, you can pull the maneuver of saying, here's a book which grades the hadith, and look, it says that it's trustworthy, it's mutawatir, or it's ahad, or what have you, and then they'll say, well, I don't trust that book. Because you have to understand, it's the, the authority structure really matters. And we'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow too, but we often, as evangelicals, put on Protestant glasses and we, you know, the sola scriptura idea, we impute to a lot of others. Um, and that, it's not the way it works amongst Muslims. It's not sola scriptura. You've got the hadith, you've got the imams, you've got the schools of thought. Uh, that's the way uh, divine knowledge is passed down. We have to remember that. And then when you are the person bringing something up to them, and you are probably being seen as an adversary, why should they trust you when their imams don't agree with what you're saying? It really affects their epistemology. Can you go back a couple of slides for more? Capture the. Yeah, right there. Thanks. <coughs> Why do they feel Asha is not one of the most trusted to be? Is that because they feel she didn't really write those? Or? So you're referring to the Shia, probably. Okay. Um, the Shia do not trust anything Aisha said. Um, and the reason why is because... No, Asha, his, his youngest, his youngest wife. Aisha, yeah, that's Aisha. Okay, she, she wrote many of the... Hindus, right? she, is, she is called Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. Okay. Um, Muhammad pointed to her as an extremely intelligent... This was his six-year-old bride. Right. Um, and so she was coming to being uh, while he was doing a lot of his uh, initial work. Um, she knew a lot about Muhammad's life. Shia don't like her. There was a, uh, the Shia, okay, I'll, I'll tell you the, the division, I probably should have already. Um, so the Sunni Muslims are the ones who say that authority passed down from Muhammad through the Ummah, or through the Muslim people, to the next person. So they'll say Muhammad died, he, Muhammad hadn't left a successor, the Ummah chose Abu Bakr, they voted for him, or they chose him, appointed him, however. Abu Bakr was the next person. After Abu Bakr was Umar, and then after Umar was Uthman, and then after Uthman was Ali. Those are the four rightly guided caliphs. The Shia say that should not be how it was. That should not have been how, that was not how it should have been. There we go. <laughs> that was not how it should have been. The, it should have passed along the house of Muhammad. It should have gone through the bloodline. And so after Muhammad died, the next person should have been Ali. Uh, Ali is Muhammad's cousin. So, they are, uh, Shia means follower, they are followers of Ali. Um, that's where the term comes from. During Ali's reign, or shortly before Ali's reign, I can't remember which, uh, Aisha marched in battle against Ali. Uh, the numbers recorded are astounding, I'm not sure how accurate they are, but Aisha supposedly brought 30,000 men to the battlefield and Ali brought 10,000 men to the battlefield. Um, and Ali won the battle, everyone agrees to that. Um, and uh, a lot of Muslim blood was shed that day. It was Muslim marching against Muslim for the first time, if you don't count the apostate wars. And at about that time, you have significant tensions um, rising between the Sunni and the Shia, and they officially get established at the death of Ali um, around that time. There was tension within Islam from the, from the very early phases, though. You look at the Quran, uh, and it says repeatedly that there's a group of people called the hypocrites. What are the hypocrites? These are Muslims, these are people who self-identify as Muslim, who 
are acting out against Muhammad. Muhammad calls them, or the Quran calls them the hypocrites because they say they're Muslim, but they don't act Muslim. But what does that tell us? You know, critically speaking, it tells us that from the beginning there's dissension in Islam. Um, and then aside from Abu Bakr, all three of the caliphs were killed. Omar, Uthman, and Ali were all killed um, at the hands of other people who consider themselves Muslim. So a lot of dissension early on. Um, so Shia take a look at Aisha and the, you know, they love Ali, they follow Ali, Ali is the one after Muhammad, and they say Aisha was his mortal nemesis, um, and so they do not trust her. Most Sunnis though, they trust Aisha, really, really highly uh, revere Aisha. You. You're welcome, ma'am. Can you define again this other term besides the Isna? Matan, so the matan is the, the hadith proper, it's what the hadith says. So for example, there's a hadith which says, um, uh, your deeds are, uh, what does that mean again? <laughs> um, uh, deeds are judged by their intentions. Um, and so that's the hadith. This is what Muhammad said, your deeds are judged by their intentions. That's the matan. The isnad is, you know, I heard this from such and such, you heard it from such and such, you heard it from such and such. So. Uh, if you go to sahibukhari.com, for example, they only give you the matan. They're, they're not giving you the isnad. And Muslims wouldn't consider that enough. They would want to see both. Sir? But the matan includes both the uh, hadith and the uh, sunnah. Yes. So sunnah... So it's not just the quote, it's the description of the act. Right. It could be either or. Yeah. The term hadith has really been expanded to cover hadith and sunnah. Um, and matan, yeah, matan is both, the proper for both. <coughs> Any other questions on hadith? Extremely important to grasp. Yeah. Yeah, musnad. What, what is that? Musnad is uh, a way of arranging hadith according to the companion who heard it. So, for example, if you want to list out all the hadith that Aisha had transferred, um, you would put that under that. There's not that many musnad collections. The most uh, famous one is Musnad Ahmed. What, what is the name of the biography? <clears throat> the earliest biography on Muhammad is called Sirat Rasulullah. Sirat is the word for biography or life of Rasul, Messenger, Allah, of Allah. Sirat Rasulullah. Um, it was written by a man named Ibn Ishaq. Uh, Ishaq is I S H A Q. Ibn, I B N. Ibn Ishaq. Earliest biography of Muhammad, written approximately 150 years after Muhammad's death. We don't have it anymore. What we have is the remnants saved by a man named Ibn Hisham. So Ibn Hisham saved some of Ibn Ishaq's work. He then edited it, and he, he says he edited it. He said there's some stuff in here that was just unbelievable, so I didn't copy it. Um, and uh, so then he has uh, what you can buy today is a translation of Ibn Ishaq through Ibn Hisham. Uh, what I gave to the class as required reading um, was an abridged version of Ibn Ishaq. Uh, Ibn Ishaq. You can find that online. If you go to Scribed, Scribed has everything. I don't know how Scribed is still online. It should be illegal, but it has everything. Yeah, uh, I saw another question. Yes? Check me out. Generate any interesting comment uh, about the relative value. To, that oh yeah, I mean, in, in your mind. yeah, Muslims and and uh, critical scholars of Islam all agree that there is a lot of difficulty that is brought into uh, the whole hadith sciences or the, the whole realm of hadith studies because of all the fabrications. Muslims have a different view though. Muslims will view the hadith as, as you can trust certain ones because you can trust the isnad. So uh, if you have trustworthy isnad from multiple chains, then you can trust the hadith. So Muslim scholars will often analyze the isnad and say this hadith is trustworthy and they have compilations of books like that. So for them it's not as much of a problem. Western scholars have had a different view for quite a while now. Um, what you had from the beginning of critical scholarship on Islam in the West, you had what was called the descriptive approach, and I'm using terms borrowed from, 
Frank Donner, um, who's a current Islam scholar, he says that it was a descriptive approach uh, at first, which basically they would relay the story of Muhammad, um, but they would, when it came to Hadith, they would say, the Hadith aren't really historical. There's some th historical things we can glean from them, but they're more or less for religious purposes, not for historical purposes. As studies progressed, people began to wrestle more and more with the Hadith um, and with the traditional way that the story was told. Um, the next field of studies in Islam was the source critical. So I'm, I'm talking about Western scholarship for the most part. Um, source critical studies began to take over the descriptive approach. And what they tried to do is they tried to analyze layers of hadith, compare them with one another, um, and they tried to import non-Muslim sources and use those for corroboration. As they went further and further, they realized that you have, it, it, the whole source critical approach has this presupposition that writings were the initial form of a message. Whereas we know that's not the case. The message in the, in the case of Islam was almost entirely oral for hundreds of years. And so people began to kind of evolve their view. It went from a source critical approach to a tradition critical approach. And when you got to that point, people began to realize there is not much about the Hadith that we can actually pin on Muhammad. And that's what bore out the skeptical approach, which is espoused by a lot of scholars today. Uh, and we'll talk about all that tomorrow. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to go a lot more in depth than that tomorrow. You're welcome. Okay, let's um, do the last section and then we'll leave the last few minutes for questions. Islamic law. Now, I'm not going to tell you what Islamic law teaches. I'm going to tell you what it is because it's really hard to tell you what Islamic law teaches when a lot of people disagree on it. Um, the law itself is called Sharia which means path to water. In other words, this is the way you're gonna receive life. This is God's law for mankind. Now, figuring out what Sharia is, is the process of fiqh. Fiqh is jurisprudence. Fiqh is, uh, uh, well, the system of fiqh is what people use in order to determine what Sharia teaches. So Sharia is kind of God's law and fiqh is how you figure it out. It's based on three or four components, depending on whom you ask. The first component is the Qur'an. As we know, the Qur'an is, is the essential. It's the crux of Islam for all Muslims. I don't know a single Muslim who denies the Qur'an. Then you have the Hadith. Uh, the Hadith are the second component. And again, some people consider some Hadith trustworthy. They consider other Hadith untrustworthy. And you have lots of disagreements on the Hadith. Therefore, you're going to have lots of, lots of disagreement on Sharia. Sharia is going to look different to you depending on what hadith you subscribe to and how you interpret the Quran accordingly. Then you've got ijma, or the consensus of scholarship. Understanding, again, that Islam doesn't work in this kind of sola scriptura sense. You've got a line of teachers, schools of thought, uh, where you'll generally check your jurisprudence off of if you're a Muslim jurist. Um, by the way, Muslim jurists are called fuqaha, F-U-Q-A-H-A, -A, um, and they're the ones who make these calls. The average Muslim is not able to do any of this. Uh, they'll look at you if you try to do any of this and they'll say, who do you think you are? You haven't studied Islam the way a sheikh um, or the fuqaha have. Uh, how dare you think you can understand what Islam teaches? You have to ask them. So uh, the ijma, the consensus of scholarship, usually follows lines of thought, schools of thought. Nowadays, we're seeing a change in that, but we'll talk about that on Saturday. Some people consider there to be a fourth component to fiqh, and that's called qiyas, which is reasoning, reasoning by analogy, etc. So using these principles, they will try to determine what certain, uh, how a certain person should react. So for example, if a husband commits a certain transgression against a wife, can that wife divorce her husband? She would have to go to a mufti um, or one of the other fuqaha and ask them, uh, am I allowed to divorce him now? And they will make a decision. That decision, by the way, is called a fatwa, uh, F-A-T-W-A, fatwa. So that is how it occurs. You aren't allowed to do this yourself. You go and get decisions. Now, those decisions are never binding. Uh, a Muslim can take that decision and go to a different mufti and say, can you give me a decision? And they can keep going until they get the decision they want. Um, often they don't do that though, they'll stick with the decision that they're given. 
The Sharia law courts in Britain, um, I'm sure you're familiar. Um, you have a Sharia law courts in Britain. They mostly deal with marital issues. The vast majority of what they're dealing with are divorce cases. Um, and again, they're not binding, but Muslims are generally pressured into going there to get a Muslim decision from their, uh, from their members, um, their fellow members of their circles. Traditionally, there have been four major schools of Sunni thought. Uh, you've got the Shafi in no particular order, the Shafi, the Hanbali, the Hanafi, and the Maliki. These four schools uh, are followed by various people, various levels, they teach variant things, but only slightly so. Um, for example, I forget which school it was, but one school of thought says that if you become an apostate and you deny Islam, then you are to be killed on the spot. Another school says you are to be given three days to repent, and if after those three days you don't repent, then you are to be killed. Minor disagreement, um, not too major. Uh, one school, for example, will say whether a woman has any say in whom she marries. Can a woman say no? Can she say yes? Uh, another, one school will say yes, another school will say no. So not huge theological differences here, more or less minor ones. People began shopping. They began shopping between schools to get decisions they wanted. Um, that was looked at negatively for a while. Uh, as we'll discuss more on Saturday, these schools have begun to dissipate, though and we're seeing a revolution in the way Islam works. Uh, one second. You, you see other schools of thought as well. Uh, again, these are the four major schools of Shia thought. There are three major schools of, I'm sorry, those are the four major schools of Sunni thought. There are three major schools of Shia thought. Uh, the last one being the largest there, the Imami. And then you got the Zaydi and the Ismaili as well. And then you have other schools altogether. Again, when you're talking about someone like uh, a Qur'ani person, they're gonna have an entirely idiosyncratic view. Um, same with a lot of Sufis. Question. Within the Sufi schools of thought, what's the school, the school that says you can kill a person, and what's the school that says uh, you give them time to repent, and then go to school? Says, within the Sunni, or? He says that within the Sufi schools right. of thought, if there's an apostate, there's Yeah, I don't remember which one's which. What, which one's you guys? Yeah, I don't remember which one's which. Um, I could look that up for you if you'd like. Uh, but I don't remember which one teaches that you have to kill immediately and which one says you can wait three days. Uh, that, you're usually getting into some pretty detailed study at that point. Uh, I generally focus on what the Hadith say and not so much how they interpret the Hadith. Um, so I, I try to stick with the primary sources. This is, you're, you're getting into secondary source literature here. Yeah. What, what was it specifically? Um, about allowing Sharia law to take presence here in the States. And if it does, what if somebody was going to expel somebody because they did renounce Islam? Well, so in the case of Sharia courts, I, I think we can see a lot of precedents in the United Kingdom for the United States. So what Muslims are doing in the UK, they're beginning to do here. Um, and so. I think that's a, just a sheer function of numbers, demographics. I don't think that they have some grand scheme. Um, I just don't think it's, I mean, you might have some people who are networking with others, but generally speaking, Muslims aren't part of a grand scheme. Um, what you have in the UK is the Muslims were able to convince the government to allow Sharia courts mainly for civil decisions, not for criminal cases. So when it comes to beheading or something like that, we're talking about criminal issues. Uh, we're talking here about divorce, inheritance, you know, property rights, stuff like that, civil issues. That's mostly what the Sharia courts in the UK cover, and again, the vast majority of that is divorce. Um, in the US, if Sharia were to become uh, the norm uh, in some way, shape, or form, who knows, amongst Muslims, then we would probably see something similar. I don't know if you know, Ikna just started a campaign, uh, the Islamic Council the Islamic Council of North America, of North America. thank you. <laughs> um, ICNA just started a campaign to uh, make Sharia more palatable to Americans. 
Uh, so they want to ultimately work in that direction. You have people on the opposite side of the spectrum who are trying to stop Sharia from entering into the U.S. Oklahoma tried to pass some legislation on that. The main reason for all this is because we've seen American courts use Islamic precedents. For example, there was a case in New Jersey where a woman complained to the authorities that she was being beaten by her husband. The judge ruled in her husband's favor because it's allowed in Islam. Um, that was a huge deal. That was overturned at the next court, thankfully. But, you know, that issue became a forefront issue. So, uh, that's a very interesting point. As far as Sharia is concerned, we have seen in Europe that the Sharia proposition that you cannot condemn Islam, that you cannot criticize Islam, we have seen that make it into the UN. The UN has passed a non-binding resolution saying you're not allowed to criticize Islam. Um, so it's becoming a real thing. Um, again, it's more political. We'll hold our we'll hold our conversation on that. No, it's all right. Um, but it's, it is an important issue, ma'am. Yeah. Haven't there been cases where like fathers have killed children? Um, they've yep, yeah, they've killed children for all kinds of reasons. Uh, now, honor killings are more loosely connected to Islam than apostasy killings. Um, there is a whole conference that's gonna happen on this issue in the next week. It's called the Jessica Mokdad Conference. It's gonna happen up in Michigan. Um, and uh, specifically, it's named after a girl who was killed by her stepfather, I believe. It addresses these issues. Um, it talks about how, how honor killings are related to Islam at no point does the, does, do the hadith say, kill, kill your child if they dishonor you, or anything like that? But you do have things like kill the homosexual, or kill the one who's causing mischief. That's in the Quran even. Um, you know, kill the apostate. Uh, that's all over hadith. And so you have this parallel, um, where you're supposed to kill people who dishonor Islam under specific circumstances. What a lot of the folk do who try to defend an Islamic basis for honor killings is they say, look, Islam teaches that in order to handle these kinds of, uh, of misappropriations of Islamic teaching, Islam teaches that you're supposed to kill them, and so it's easy to extrapolate that to you're becoming westernized, you're becoming uh, less and less rigorous in your Islamic faith, therefore you can be killed. But there's a whole conference on this issue. Um, it's a tragic issue, but I'm not so sure, just to summarize my position, I'm not so sure you can directly connect that to Islam as opposed to folk Islam. I'm not convinced one way or the other. I, I haven't taken a stand on that. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.